have any questions to start on the material we have covered so far? It's very elementary, right? I mean, all of you had seen already. Okay, good. So let us continue with uh, still some slightly formal objects. So we're discussing the exponential uh, of an operator. Okay? And we said that it is defined by uh, the formal Taylor expansion. So sum of the power n of the operator with a factor 1 over n factorial in front, where I assume that 0 factorial is 1 and n to the 0 is the identity operator. So, okay? Um, we said that, uh, generally speaking, uh, this is not allowed. Okay? So if I have the exponential of two operators, okay, you cannot exchange the position and you cannot regroup them, okay, as you would do with ordinary functions, unless the two operators commute, okay, so the commutator which we define to be uh, equal to O1, O2, minus O2, O1, okay, uh, if this is zero, okay, then you can actually do uh, this, but if this is different from zero, mm, then this is generally speaking different. Mm. However, <coughs> something that is very similar to ordinary uh, function is the following. If I have a derivative with respect to t, say time, of e to the uh, sum operator multiplied by t, by time. This is something we will encounter in a second with the Hamiltonian and the evolution operator. Then, this is O e to the O t. Okay? This is as if these were ordinary exponentials. Okay? The reason for this, uh, it's a very simple um, uh, proof based on this. Shall we do it? Okay, let's do it quickly. If you have doubt, you stop me. Okay? So, I do write the uh, left hand side, okay, here. So, sum, well, let's do it explicitly. Identity plus the first order term plus 1 over 2 factorial O squared T squared plus 1 over 3 factorial O cubed T cubed, okay? T is just a number, so I can just uh, group them together. Hmm? Fantastic. Plus dots. Hmm? Then I take a derivative. Hmm? Okay. The derivative of the identity gives me 0. Plus this gives me O. Plus this gives me a factor 2 and therefore just 1 O squared times T. Plus the 3 gives me 1 over 2 factorial O cubed T squared. Okay? Is it clear how to proceed, right? Now you see this is out. I can put here the operator O as a common factor, hmm? and then I have the identity plus <coughs> OT plus 1 over 2 factorial O squared T squared plus blah blah blah. Okay? When you realize that this is nothing but the exponential of OT. Is it clear to everybody? Hmm. Okay. So, we proved this. Very good. Okay. Uh, okay, let's consider the following operator now. U of t, which is the exponential of minus i, the Hamiltonian of your system, times t, divided by h bar. So, essentially, something similar to this, except that I specify explicitly some factors. The minus i, the time, and the h bar. Mm? So, mm, uh, obviously I can immediately use this formula here. And if I ask you what is the derivative of u of t, mm, then you say, very simple. I just do as in 
ordinary thing. So I bring down the factor that I have there. So minus i h over h bar. Hmm? And then I have the same object, so u of t. OK? Uh, fantastic. So <coughs> uh, let me just, you know that psi of t, psi of x and t, hmm, the wave function, obeys the time-dependent linear Schrodinger equation, OK? which is this, OK, times psi of x and t. In fact, this equation is even more general. It is not true just for a wave function of a single particle, but it's more general for any quantum system with the many particle wave function, blah, blah, blah. So there are lots of, um, lots of um, generalization of this, including rel relativity, OK? The Dirac equation is based on a very similar uh, structure, except that psi is not a single wave function, but is a multi-component spinner, OK? But this is something which uh, doesn't not matter for, for us now, OK? So this is uh, the equation that, the Schrodinger equation, that any, fun, any wave function should satisfy. Now the claim is that I can write psi of x and t is equal to this operator u mm, applied to psi of x at time t equals 0. Okay? So somehow the operator u of t does the job of performing the evolution. You take an initial wave function and u of t transforms it into the wave function at time t. That's the reason why it is called the evolution operator. Okay? Let's see. let's prove this. Hmm? To prove it, I apply the derivative to both uh, sides. Okay? Let's do it on the left hand side, i h bar, the derivative with respect to t of psi x and t. How much it is? Schrodinger tells me. It's h times psi of x and t. Okay? Let's do it on the right hand side now. Okay? I h bar, the derivative with respect to t of u of t, okay, times applied to psi x at time zero. Hmm? But this I know. Okay? In fact, let's massage a little bit this object. Let's multiply this by i h bar. Okay, so here I have i h bar. Mm -hmm. h bar goes, and i times minus i is actually equal to one. Okay, so the massage simply says that this object is equal to h times q. Mm -hmm. So I do it here. So this is equal to h times u of t times psi of x and zero. But this object here, according to my equality there, is nothing but psi of x and t. So this is h psi of x and t. OK? And you see that the two things coincide. Is it clear to everybody? Hmm? OK? So a very formal solution of this equation hmm, is that the evolution is performed by an operator, which is the evolution operator, which is the exponential of the Hamiltonian with the appropriate factors of time and the important i. Okay? Good. Now, obviously, this is, in some sense, uh, not a shortcut. It doesn't mean that it's very easy to construct u and therefore it's very easy to solve the Schrodinger equation. It's formally easy, but as I told you, the exponential of an operator is a horrible beast involving all powers, okay? So don't think that uh, you do it uh, for free, okay? It's easy to write, but difficult to calculate in general. Okay, nevertheless, it's a useful tool. Hmm? But the next question we will now to uh, ask is the following. What 
would you uh, think? So let me erase some of the stuff, okay? Uh, what would you think to be a good definition of, uh, say, the probability of finding the particle somewhere? Hmm? So the next thing is. If I ask you the probability for finding the particle in some position x or around some position x, it's a probability density more precisely. As you know, when you have continuous variable, uh, the probability should be generalized to the probability density to find in a small volume, right? So, how is this related to? Um, um, so what is the relationship with psi of x and t? Now, as you realize, psi is inevitably complex. Even if you start from a real wave function, hmm, the Schrodinger equation with this i hmm, but makes it complex immediately. Hmm? Which means that this is a complex object, while this is a probability. So I want a real positive quantity, right? So obviously, it cannot be psi. Uh, but you might say, okay, why not the modulus of psi? Hmm? Not really, not really. You need a square here, okay? Yeah, but to prove this, that the square is the only sensible thing to have. But I can give you a couple of arguments. The first is essentially the analogy with the uh, electromagnetism. In electromagnetism, the field is the electric field and the magnetic field. And the conserved quantity, because after all, you want something that is conserved, the probability of finding. Huh? The conserved quantity is the energy, and the energy is the square of the field, right? Mm. Okay, this is an argument one might say, who cares? I mean, you didn't convince me. Mm. But now I want to give you a stronger argument, so, which is the following. So I want a few requirements on this P. The P, as I told you, should be non-negative, real and non-negative. Second, I pretend uh, an overall conservation. So if I calculate the, the derivative of the total integral of P and X and T, so I'll, I assume that this integral is defined. So the total probability for finding particle somewhere is uh, well, it's the fact. Hmm? No, I want the derivative of this thing to be just zero. Somewhere the particle is, and it doesn't change the probability to find it, right? And in fact, if this probability is zero, then this object is constant in time, and we can kind of uh, assume, okay, that the correct constant is one. The probability to find in the particle somewhere is one, okay? Notice the equation is linear, so you can always rescale things, okay? And therefore it makes sense to just impose that the total probability of finding the particle is 1. Hmm? If, if psi is not such that this is true, then just rescale it and nail it down to be 1, okay? Good. So I will show you that the only sensible uh, uh, proposal for respecting this thing is this. Hmm? To do it, so the crucial thing, well, A is obviously okay, right? But even the first modulus would satisfy this. Hmm? And the third power, or the fourth power, or any power of the modulus would do it. Uh, but this is a very strict thing, okay? And only the two survives. Hmm? Let's see why. I could show it directly. So I could just calculate this integral for you. Use the Schrodinger equation, you will show that the result is zero, but I prefer to do a tool which uh, brings us some extra tools in our bag. Hmm? So there are things that will be useful anyway. So let's do a, a proof that uses this um, uh, new concept. Hmm? Um, well, before I venture a comment, but comment later. Okay. Um, so, tools. Tool number one. I have functions, okay? 
in this space of function, space of complex functions, mm, the size, mm, I introduce a scalar product. The scalar product is defined in this way. Psi 1, I have a function, another function, psi 2. This is the notation, OK? With the bar in the middle. The scalar product of function is defined as the integral over all space of the star of the function on the left times the function on the right, without star. Hmm? Notice the mathematicians have a different notation. Hmm? They take the star of this. OK, we don't. OK, in physics, all of this is star to the left. No quantum mechanical books. But if you go to the mathematical literature, you find the star on the right. Be careful. OK? Uh, second thing. <clears throat> uh, second thing, they like this, the, this notation. Or something with a round parenthesis. So, OK? They don't like the cats and brass, but this is Dirac that somehow gave us this imprinting and we all respectively follow it. Okay? Good. Um, now, this scalar product defines a norm, how the length, the length of vectors, as usual, as in Euclidean vectors. You know that with that I can define essentially the length of a vector to be the scalar product of the vector with itself. Hmm? This object is nothing but the integral over dx of psi star psi, so the modulus square of psi star. Okay? Is it clear? And you see the reason for having the star here. Without the star is the square of the function. But the function is a complex function, and this object will be a complex number. I want the length. I want some real quantity, some positive real quantity. OK? So the star is important. Clear? Now, there are many, norm, many, many scalar products and many associated norms that you can define on a space of function. OK? Uh, never mind. This is the most useful one for us. And it's called the L2 norm. 2 because of this 2 here. Okay? You can define LP norms or infinity norms, never mind. Let's block the thing here. Okay? One thing that you notice is that the norm is defined for all functions whose integral or modulus square is finite. Okay? So this should be less than infinity. Mm -hmm. Now, our below function the psi k of x that we introduced uh, perhaps yesterday or last time, the plane wave, huh? the modulus square of this object, how much it is? One. one. Okay, so the integral over one of one over the whole space is infinity. So they are not normalizable. Not normalizable. Okay, so technically speaking, they do not belong to the space of normalizable function equipped with this scalar product and norm, okay? Which is called the L2 space, Hilbert space. Never mind, they are nevertheless useful because based on them you can write Fourier transform, okay? So strictly speaking, somehow they are not normalizable, but with them you can expand any normalizable function, okay? Because, if you remember, any psi of x, I can write it as the integral over dk of square root of 2 pi to the power third of phi k times e to the i k. Okay? So they are, each of them is not normalizable, but you see they are useful in integrals, in Fourier integrals, and so why not admitting some of them? Let's do an exception. Okay? They are good anyway for us. Huh? Okay, now, uh, this is the first tool. The second tool is the uh, concept of Hermitian operator. Now, an operator is anything that acts on the wave function, we said, okay? What is the meaning of Hermitian? The meaning of Hermitian is the following. 
that if I have two functions, psi1 and psi2, and I act with the with, oh, psi2 with this operator, hmm, then the resulting scalar product with psi1 is the same thing as acting on psi1 with the operator and taking the scalar product with psi2. Okay? And this is true for any pairs of states, not just for two part particular ones. Okay? So, so now the emission operators are the operators that can fly across this bar and can go to the left without having <coughs> any anything to no passport, okay? It's free. They can go, okay? Back and forth, no, nothing, nothing forbids them. Okay, very good. Now, all the operators we have encountered so far essentially are emission operators. Let me give you the simplest example. We said the position operator, okay? The position operator is that object such that when you apply it to a function, it's simply the product of x times the function, okay? So in one dimension, for instance, just x, three dimension with it, okay, three components. Now, obviously, mm, it takes one second to realize that, for instance, let's, let's do it in 1D, okay? So I have just, just x mm, without uh, errors, psi 2. What is this? According to my definition of scalar product, is the integral in dx of psi 1 star times x psi 2x, right? This is the right hand side. Mm. Fantastic. But mm, on the left, what I have? I have uh, x applied to psi 1 and psi 2, which is integral of x psi 1 of x star, because it's on the left, psi 2. Mm. But x is a real number, okay? So x star is equal to x. Right? So I can write this as well as like this. Okay? And now you see it's the same thing. Okay? Fantastic. So it is an issue. Good. Um, any power of an emission operator is emission. Okay? In other words, if O is emission, then O square is also emission. Why? Because you just let them travel one at a time. Okay? So, uh, somehow, you write O as O, O, okay? O is emission, so it goes to the left, okay? And you have O psi 1, O psi 2, but O is again emission, and it goes to the left, there. So, equal to O squared psi 1 psi 2, okay? And this works with the third power, fourth power, any power. So, if we have an emission operator, I can take any power, still emission. Okay, good. What else? The sum of two emission operators is emission. Because everything is linear here. So if somehow I have psi O1 uh, plus OA, say, plus OB, okay, these are two emission operators, okay? Well, first of all, the scalar product is a linear object, okay? Linear in each of the two arguments, obviously. Hmm? which means that this is equal to psi 1, the operator psi 2, plus psi 1, the operator B, psi 2. Is it clear why it's linear? Well, you see it from here. If I have a sum of two functions, the integral is just the sum of the two integrals, right? Good. But each one of them is emission, so it flies to the left, hmm? and then you recollect them, hmm? obviously, now, for linearity with respect to this, notice linearity here, uh, uh, one, one, one remark in a second, okay? But certainly, <laughs> we have to remember that now, this means O psi 1 star, okay? So when I write this to the left, it's O A psi 1 star integral of psi 2 of x, okay? Good. Um, now, why I say uh, uh, careful with the linearity? For the following reason. Hmm? If I have an, uh, uh, um, I multiply, for instance, um, psi 2 by a constant, alpha. Hmm? 
then it's clear okay the, the result is simply alpha psi 1 psi 2 right for any alpha real or complex hmm? if I do it all the and, and this is somehow an, an expected linearity if I do it on the left hmm? I have to be a little bit more careful okay so let's do it alpha psi 1 psi 2 is equal to the integral of alpha psi 1 star psi 2 I omit the, the, the x okay and this is equal to alpha star psi 1 psi 2 so somehow this is a bit to be noticed so when I uh, multiply things by constants careful the linearity is standard to the right is a kind of anti-linearity on the left okay so there are stars that come out from constant okay but this is something just to be careful to set at times here there is no difficulty this is the definition okay good so the product of operator of the same operators is emission the powers the sum of two operators is so immediately since x is emission what about the potential B of x. Well, the potential is expanded in Taylor series is the sum of powers of x. And so obviously this is an emission. Okay? Any potential is an emission operator. Fantastic. Let's now consider the next tricky thing. Well, not tricky, but uh, the momentum. The momentum. Let's do it in one dimension. Okay, psi 1, P, psi 2. Okay, what is this? It's the integral of psi 1 of x times minus i h bar, the derivative with respect to x, of psi 2 of x. The strokes are really terrible. Okay. Good. Now you, 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 you say, okay, mm, let's see. What should I do to bring the operator to the left? The thing is, let's integrate by parts. Mm? Okay. If I integrate by parts, okay, what I find is that essentially this object um, uh, becomes uh, psi 2, okay? So I have minus i h bar, mm? the integral in dx of psi 1 star times sorry not the integral but this psi 1 times psi 2 of x evaluated between plus infinity and minus infinity hmm? and then I have minus sign with this minus becomes a plus i h bar the integral hmm, from minus infinity to plus infinity of um, the derivative now acting on psi 1 star psi 2 of x. Is it clear? I did just integration by part as in elementary analysis. Okay. <coughs> Let's look at the first term. The terms coming from the boundary. Since the wave functions are assumed to be both normalizable functions, it means that they should vanish at plus infinity, both. Mm? and therefore these are actually zero okay. and then you have this and you might say hey but this is not the momentum mm. okay, so or it is I mean what I would like to have is that this is P psi 1 psi 2 let's write this this is the integral of minus i h bar the derivative apply to psi 1 star first apply p then take the star mm -hmm. and split psi 2 of x mm -hmm. when you do it well, the derivative doesn't care and the minus i becomes a plus okay so the things are indeed the same thing and in fact if I don't put this i here Okay, and I use just the derivative. When I ask you, is the derivative an emission operator? You should answer no, it's not. Because 
because the integration by part is a minus sign and the derivative alone is not able to fly from right to left. It needs an I. With the I and the star, they cooperate together and they can fly freely. Okay? So, quite remarkably, P is indeed emission because of the I. Hmm? And obviously, by the theorem I told you before, uh, say P square, or in fact any power of P is emission. Okay? Remember, P square is the kinetic energy. So, fantastic. So, kinetic energy is an emission operator. The potential energy is an emission operator. What about the Hamiltonian? Okay, for instance, the usual non relativistic Hamiltonian. P square plus V of X is the sum of two emission operators and therefore is an emission operator. Okay? So, we have ended up our recollection of the operators encountered so far. They are all emission. Okay? That's fantastic. <coughs> okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Is the emission operators defined at all with the not normalizable? There are um, well, there are very subtle things that you have to do to work with. Uh, uh, no, for, for instance, for instance, just uh, I eliminated this thing. Okay. If the function is uh, non normalizable, you have to be careful. But there are, in any case, subtle mathematical things related to the properly defining uh, emission adjoints and things in infinitely dimensional Hilbert space. I will not touch on them. We will not care in practical things. But if you are a mathematical physicist, you might say, how, where, what is the domain of functions on which this object is defined, and blah, 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 okay? So there might be subspaces of your space where the operator is well defined, and other spaces, other states where it is not defined. We don't care. We are physicists, very, very uh, crude ones um, uh, on top of that, and therefore, for us, okay, it's, everything is... When there is a mathematical subtlety, we kind of pass over like uh, caterpillars. Okay, good. Okay, now, why did I introduce all these tools? I, I, I remind you that I just wanted to, to show conservation of probability. Hmm? <coughs> okay, I'll show you now how nice and simple is the proof now. <coughs> This object is perfectly clear and not ambiguous. Mm? I don't write h star psi, h psi star. Here I did, I mean, simply the same thing, but I immediately used it. This is a minus, a minus one. Okay, now <coughs> I want this object, okay, so I calculate derivative with this. So this left hand side, derivative with respect to time of the integral of P and I told you that my guess is that P is this ok, so let's use it Psi modulus square is Psi star of X and T Psi of X and T good so I apply the derivative inside I told you we are brutal physicists so I exchange the order of derivatives and integrals, okay? And if things are nice, they don't complain. Hmm? <laughs> okay, so here I apply now the derivative on two on the two things. So I have two terms, right? The first is the integral 
of the derivative with respect to time. Uh, notice sometimes I write uh, the derivative with respect to time like this. Uh, more properly, if I have in it with a wave function of x and t, this would be a partial derivative only with respect to t, okay? But uh, since very often one works with cats, okay, in abstract representation, uh, the cats, the wave function would be this with just t, this is okay. Mm -hmm. So, forget about this slight notational um, object. Okay, so here I have the derivative of x and t mm, with the star, the times the psi, okay, and then I have plus the integral of psi star x and t, the derivative of psi of x and t. Okay? Good. Now, what is this? Well, you read it from here. Is this, right? So it's 1 over i h bar h applied to psi. So I substitute here 1 over i h bar h psi of x and t. Okay? Now what is this? You read it from here. It's minus 1 over i h bar okay, uh, times h psi star. Okay? Now we use our bag of tools. What is this object? The subject is um, psi, the wave function, a time t, times h psi, a time t, because it's a scalar problem. And there is 1 over i h bar, also. But I told you that the object is linear to the right. So the subject is also 1 over i h bar, psi times t, h psi times t. Okay? What about the left-hand side? On the left-hand side, this I can write as 1 over i h bar well forget it it's already out it's minus 1 over i h bar uh, on the left I have h psi at time t and on the right I have psi at time t okay so this is what I wrote sum of two terms but h is a mission so H, no passport, can go anywhere. Here, for instance. So it's the same thing. So these two objects are, in fact, the same object. Okay? But here I have a plus, and here I have a minus. So the result is zero. zero. Okay? This shows, by the way, that's about the norm. You see, this is the modulus square of psi of t, right? So the norm, the total norm, is just conserved, okay? It doesn't depend on time. So the evolution moves the shape of the wave function, but the total integral modulus square, which is the L2 norm. So, so now this object is the integral inside the L2 norm. Hmm? That's the reason why it is particularly useful, the L2 law. Hmm? It's concerned. Okay? You immediately see that if I have anything else, for instance, the fourth power, that wouldn't be true. Okay? So, only the, the second power. Okay? And this was Max Born that, in fact, um, I think understood this. Okay? Very good. Clear so far? Now, a word on the notation. Dirac versus rest of the world. Uh, as I told you, a mathematician would write scalar product, for instance, most likely like this. Okay? Um, I, uh, we physicists write it 
like this. Okay? So far, so math, fifth. So far, however, <coughs> I used psi 1 operator psi 2. Okay? To me, take the operator, act on the state, hmm? and then take the scalar polar with psi 1. Obviously, a mathematician will write it as psi 1 O psi 2. Okay? But now, I do one further uh, twist, and I write it like this. Okay? This is Dirac. It is the same thing. It is exactly the same object. The difference is, somehow, that here I imagine the operator acting on the right, okay, and then taking the scalar product with one. Here all sits democratically, in the middle, okay? There is something on the right and something on the left. And in the middle there is this thing between two bars, okay? No problem. Usually, for instance, you might say, okay, let's act with this operator on the right. Eh? And then you... Or you might think, oh, maybe I just let it act on the left here, okay? The reason for having this slightly more kind of democratic uh, appearance of the operator right in the middle is because one gives meaning also to these two guides separately. Okay, this Dirac would call it a vector in the Hilbert space and this is the bra. This is called the bra. This is called in fact the cat and the meaning is that this is the bra cat. Okay, but this is just a kind of a joke of names. Okay, which <coughs> Invented to somehow justify the search. The object itself is nothing but operator applied to a state scalar problem. That's it for the time being. Later on, we will play a little bit around with this concept of bra and I will show you what it means. Okay, for the time being, I close the notational session here. Okay, so don't ask what is the bra. Nothing. It's what goes to the left in taking the scalar problem. Hmm? Okay, now let's open a new slide uh, window is averages, okay? We will do a lot later on about average value of things. Mm? Because after all, when you do measurements, you don't have operators, you have uh, numbers in the lab, right? So I can ask you what is the average of this or the average of that. One thing that is simple is, if I have a function <coughs> psi of x and t, let's do it in one dimension, hmm? the probability of measuring the uh, particle at x, I told you, is the modulus square of x and t. Okay, and if I ask you what is the average value of x after you measure several, several times, okay, then you would say, well, the average x, we indicate like this. This is just the notation of uh, probability. You, use, you often use the thing to indicate the experimental average of, of something. Okay, to remind us that we are kind of averaging the operator x, I just put the, the hat, okay, to remind you of some quantum mechanical thing that you would write certainly the integral of the quantity times the probability. Okay? So you see immediately that, first of all, this average in general depends on t. Hmm? Okay? So this is the experimental average that you would take hmm, by just taking x and multiplying them by the probability of the particle being in x and integrating over all x. Is it clear? You would do that, right? Just uh, in the lab. Hmm. Okay, then I would say, okay, if you do that, this is the same thing as psi star x psi of x, right? I'll just split p into psi star psi. And then I use my bag of tool and I say, ah, but this is then psi at time t x operator applied to psi at time t. With or without the bar, depending if you are fan of Dirac or not. Okay? That's still 
insist on this. Okay? Clear? So you take the operator, huh? but let's put it, let's put it, let's start familiarizing with the thing. So what you do to calculate the average, you take the operator and you bracket between psi and psi. Hmm? And this will give you the average that you would expect in measuring x at n t. Is it clear? Okay? Good. Now, this definition will again insist more later on when we'll talk about measurement, but is somehow perfectly mirrored by the operation of what is the average of an arbitrary operator A. Suppose that I have an Hermitian operator A that I want to measure. So this average will depend on T again, in general. The definition is Psi of T H A applied to Psi of T. And again, you can put the bar if you are the rack fan. Okay? So, essentially the integral of Psi star of X and T the operator applied to Psi of X and T. Okay? This will be a general definition. Later on, we'll justify why. Hmm? It mirrors this. Now, one thing. <coughs> if A is a potential energy, then it's essentially the same thing as here. So you average the potential on the probability. Hmm? But if A is the momentum, for instance, therefore is a derivative, then, so let's do it average P. Okay, average P is the integral over dx of psi star x and t minus i h bar, the derivative with respect to x of psi of x and t, right? Now, it's not true that this is equal to something which involves the p squared, okay? There's no probability here. Because one piece is a derivative with respect to x and the other is just psi star. So careful, some, somehow this notion uh, uh, is not uh, straight when uh, you have the derivatives uh, in the operator. Okay? So careful. And this also communicates the message that p itself is not all the information you might want to have. Is the psi that is crucial in quantum mechanics. P is a, a secondary thing. Okay? You can form the probability. But by knowing P, you wouldn't be able to reconstruct, for instance, this average. You need to know psi to reconstruct that. Okay? So this somehow tells you the role of psi with respect to the role of, C, of P. Psi is more important. And by the way, I forgot to mention one thing. <coughs> uh, <coughs> I said I would do it later. If I have two states, and, the, and if I ask you what is the probability of finding um, the particle when it is in the sum of the two states, then since there is a modulus square here, this is different from the probability of finding in one and the probability of finding the, on the other thing. So there are interference effects, okay? Uh, which is exactly the same thing you would have for the energy of an electromagnetic field. If I calculate the sum of two fields, and I want to know the energy of the sum of the two fields, since these are waves, hmm, the energy of the sum, which is the modulus square of the sum of the electric fields is not uh, equal to the sum of the energies. Because there are terms that come from the mixed term. They are called interference terms. Okay? So somehow the structure of the theory already suggests that uh, interference uh, between um, wave functions is in principle important. It should be taken care of. Okay. <coughs> End of the comment. <clears throat>
Ok, questo è il sofà? Ok. Uh, so we will accept this as a definition for a while, and later on I will somehow justify it. Yeah? Ok. Now, one important uh, thing is that uh, this object here, if A is a mission, is real. Okay? In other words, I want to prove now that if uh, the operator A or O, whatever, O is a mission, then the expectation of O on the state, meaning psi O psi, is real. Okay? How do you prove it? But let's see. Let's take the star. Okay? So, uh, the star of O is psi O psi star. But now, look at this object here. The star of psi 1, psi 2, star, is equal to the integral where you have the star here and no stars there. So it's equal to psi 2, psi 1. So this is a very useful thing to remember. When you take the star of a, square, of a scalar product, switch the two states. One goes to the left and one to the right. Okay, let's do it here. So this is just switching the states of psi, psi. Okay, but if, if O is a mission, it can travel to the right. Okay, so this is equal to psi or psi. Alright? And therefore, this is just equal to its itself. Okay? With the star and without star it's the same thing. And therefore it's real. Is it clear to everybody? The default. Okay? Fantastic. So the expectation value defined in this funny way. Hmm? So bracketing the operator between the same state to the right and to the left is automatically real. Hmm? Which means that if this has to do with measurements, huh, then when you measure the expected value of an emission operator, you find the real quantity, which is a very reasonable thing in, 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 in the lab. Okay? You make a measurement of something, some number. Hmm? Okay, good. <coughs> Final remark. And again, take, a, take P. Hmm? The expectation value of P on any state defined in this way is real. We proved there because any for any emission operator is real and P is an emission. So this is real. And it's real because of the minus R. Not uh, somehow, the minus i would suggest that ah, maybe this is complex. No, the thing is real just because there is the minus i. Okay, this is one of the uh, kind of strange things. So if I, if I calculate this, it wouldn't be real. It would be imaginary. Because when you just do the um, integration by parts, you get the minus 1. Okay, remember integration by parts is this funny minus i. Okay? So the i makes this integral real and therefore makes the expectation value of p real as it should for any emission operator. Okay? Good. Let's move on to a few other formal tools. Uh, again, uh, I, I already introduced the concept of commutator. Mm -hmm. Now, the commutator of X and P we calculated the last time, okay? Now, the commutator obviously is a very uh, widespread object. You also have in linear algebra. If I have two matrices, hmm, then the product of the two matrices is generally different if you exchange them, okay? Let's do a simple example from linear algebra, okay? For instance, take the matrix A equal to um, say 1, 0, 0, minus 1 and take the matrix B 
equal to 0, 1, 1, 0. Okay? These two matrices will come out later are very useful. This is the sigma z Pauli matrix in spin 2 by, uh, two, by 2 matrix for the spin one half of the vector and this is the sigma x by the way. Okay? But let's think of linear, linear algebra of 2 by 2 matrices. Okay, so if I calculate a times b, okay, you remember your linear algebra to do things, tra, 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 right? You do. <laughs> you do it and you find 0, 1, minus 1, 0. Okay? So, for instance, let me calculate this. I have to do the first row with the second thing. So, 1 times 1 plus 0. Done. And here, this one, this times that. 0 times 0, minus 1. There. Okay? Fantastic. Now you do B times A. Believe it or not, is minus 1. Okay, let's do this. So I have to take the first line with the second column. Okay, so 0 times 0, minus 1. There it is. Okay? So the result is different. The two objects do not commute. Very well. Given this example, or in any case, just to remember that. Uh, now, you can um, go on and do some gymnastics of commutator, which is sometimes useful. So you have to become a little bit of an athlete of commutators. Not a tremendous thing, but it can happen that you have, say, for instance, two operators, the product of the two, and you have to come out with the commutator of A times B with C. Hmm? Then you can prove the following thing. A, B, C, plus a, C, B. Okay, very simple. Just, just do it. This is A, B, C minus C, A, B. Okay, omit the hat. Okay, and just verify if you take the commutator still that there are cancellations and the thing is correct. And the way that I remember to recall this thing is that I have this product, I can have A coming out there, or B coming out there, okay? But careful to the position, okay? Don't have the B here, hmm? or the A, A here. So the A and the B should come out exactly, uh, the A comes in, in front and the B comes after, okay? With this, you get it right. Okay, a similar little gymnastic is if I have A, and now I have B and C, okay? Obviously, this is minus an operator where you have B, C, this is equal to minus B, C, A, right? Because the operator is anti-symmetric, and therefore, now you apply the rule before to this, and you revert it back with the minus sign, and you can prove immediately that this is A, B, with the C coming out, hmm? plus the B coming in front now with A, C. Okay? Very good. <coughs> with this little two rules, you can calculate, for instance, suppose that I ask you, calculate the commutator of X with P squared. Okay? What is it? Let's see. P squared is P times P. So we apply this rule, right? So you say, okay, let me just take one of the P and I put it in front. Okay? And then I have XP. And then I have plus, the other P comes out. So XP, P. Okay? But this is IH bar, and this is also IH bar. So the result is 2IH bar times P. Okay? Let's do it one more time, okay? X, P cube. Just to practice, just to familiarize, okay? Then you say, okay, I consider this to be P and times P squared, okay? So I take um, the P 
and I put it, so I have P times the commutator of X and P squared uh, plus <coughs> plus now I have XP and the P squared comes to the right. Mm. Now XP squared, I just calculated, is P times 2i h bar p and this is i h bar p squared okay but this is also p squared with the 2i h bar so the result is 3i h bar p squared okay if you do it for n it takes a little bit of uh, it's called induction in mathematics you can prove it by induction but never mind you can show that if I have p to the n, this is equal to n i h bar p to the n minus 1. Okay? Very simple application. Um, and you can do it in a similar way with the powers of x. Okay? I just noted for you. So, you can prove that xn commutator p is equal to n i h bar x to the power n minus 1. Okay? Very, very similar algebra. And at this point, um, suppose that I have a function of x, and the function of x that can be tailor expanded. Hmm? What do you think will be the commutator with P? Just the uh, Taylor yeah. sum of the right yeah. of the commutators. Right. Yeah. Be the derivative. Huh? Be the derivative. Yes. So the f of each term f of x will be the sum from n equal 1 to infinity of the f derivative, mm. uh, say in 0, divided by n factorial x to the n. Okay? When you do the, um, uh, the thing, mm, you will see that the result is a term by term derivative, and the result is nothing but uh, i h bar the derivative of x. Okay? Because the derivative has somehow all the terms uh, with the, uh, the correct power uh, n and n factorials becomes n minus 1 factorial. Do a little bit of algebra and you realize that this is the result. Okay? And by the way, you remember that if this is a potential, the derivative of the potential is the force. Okay? So now this is useful when one tries to describe uh, what is called the Ehrenfest theorem, mm? yeah. where uh, somehow the force emerges. Okay, we will see later some of this. Okay, but now just to tell you that with commutators you can do uh, quite a few things. Mm? Okay, let's close the chapter commutator and let's enter the final. Um, formal tool that we will need. We saw emission operator. Now we generalize the concept a bit. So suppose that the operator is in general not emission. Hmm? Then we define what is called the emission conjugate. Hmm? So the concept or adjoint. Okay? It's called adjoint. <coughs> or Hermitian conjugate. Okay? Once again, mathematicians would be very careful. Ah, the domain where you define the state and the domain where you define the adjoint or the Hermitian conjugate might not be coincident, so careful. Vroom, caterpillar, we go on. Okay? Um, now, the, if I have an operator, uh, say A, Sometimes I call it O, sometimes A. You do as you prefer. Okay? 
Now, uh, I calculate this, okay, for any two states. If this was a mission, then I would write, in general, the A here, right? If it is not a mission, hmm, then there is, in principle, some operator, call it A dagger, huh, which does the job, okay? So, by definition, A dagger is the operator that you have to put here on the left huh, to make the equality be true for all psi 1 and psi 2, okay? Is it clear? So, if A, if A is a mission, then A dagger is equal to A. Okay? It's almost the definition of the name. And again, there is a subtle thing about the domains in which the things are defined. We don't care. If this uh, the, the mathematician distinguish, uh, well, no, I don't care. <laughs> Is it clear? Okay. Mm. Now, suppose that I have an emission operator, okay, and I ask you, so A is emission, suppose, and I ask you, what about IA? What is the adjoint of IA? Hmm? If A is emission, it is equal to minus i a dagger okay and this is equal to minus i a if a is emission okay so in general if you put an i close to uh, an operator uh, the adjoint of that gets a minus sign okay so you realize immediately that for instance i p Mm -hmm. which would be what? Minus. H bar, the derivative with respect to x, it's anti-adjoint somehow. I mean, the adjoint is a minus itself. It's called anti-emission. Mm. Very good. And obviously, if I have the sum of two emission operators with an i, like this, and I ask you, what is the adjoint? Linearity is all right, no problem. So this is A dagger plus IB dagger. But A dagger is A because A is emission. And B is emission, but you get a minus B. Okay? So kind of like in the complex conjugate. Okay? It works a bit like in the complex conjugate of a complex thing. Two real numbers. You make the complex combination, A plus IB, hmm? real part, imaginary part, when you take the star, you get the minus. Okay? It's the same thing with emission operators. Okay. Now, we close this, <coughs> uh, this lecture by uh, showing uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle for wave functions in full generality. Okay? Uh, again, there is an even, even wider general Heisenberg uncertainty principle which holds for uh, operators but, but we, 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 st we still confine ourselves to X and P. So we want uh, commutation, um, the Heisenberg uncertainty between measurement of X and measurements of P hmm? which we already saw huh? somehow. Now the definition is the following. Let me define the uncertainty in the measure of X or better, the square of, his, of, of it. When you do uh, probability and statistics, uh, usual things, the variance of a measurement, how do you, ca how do you calculate the variance? Mm? Remember, you accumulate numbers for the measurements you make, and also uh, statistics for the square of the measurements. Okay? And then you take the sum of the squares, weighted with the probabilities, minus the average of the quantity squared, right? So here I will do exactly the same thing. So I take psi, I put the x squared, minus, I use the rack, you see? There is an extra bar, just to, for the final, minus 
the average of the quantity square. Okay? This is real, okay? So don't worry. It's a square of a real thing. All right. Now you might be worried and say, wait, but how do I know? Why do we call it delta square? Is this bigger than this? Is it bigger than this? Yes. What do you think? Yes. Can, it, can the value of the x square of something be smaller than the square of the average? No. No. no? no. In fact, you can prove that this can be written in the following way. You take x minus the average of x, you square it, and then you take the average. Okay? Shall we prove it? No, it's simple, right? Uh, when, you, when you take the square of this, let's do it quickly, you get x squared. Then I get the square of this, this is a number now, x psi squared. And then I have minus twice x times this number, right? Remember the formula for the square of a binomial. Mm. Okay, now I take the average over psi. Okay, the first term is x squared average. Then this is a number. Okay? So if I have a number between psi and psi is just well, psi and psi is psi modulus square. I assume that psi is normalized. Okay? So psi psi is equal to 1. Mm? And therefore this is nothing but psi x psi square. And then I have minus twice. Again this number I can take it out. So psi x psi. Mm? And then I have x in between psi and psi. So psi, x, psi. Hmm? Now you see, this is nothing but the square of this number. So there is a plus with a minus 2. Exactly equal to this minus 1. Okay? So these two things are in fact the same object. Hmm? And written in this way, it's more clear why this is uh, positive. It's essentially the square of some operator, okay? And this is an emission operator. If I subtract a number, a real number from an operator, it's still an emission operator. And if I have an emission operator A, and I want to calculate the square of it, okay? This is positive, always. Okay, why? Let's see. Why the square of an emission operator has a positive expectation value? Because uh, in the first order it's just a real number and when you square it up you'll get real. It could be real and negative. But when you square it up you get... But this is not, this is not psi a psi squared. This is different. So I need a different proof. Maybe I, I failed to understand what you say. You should say it right. <laughs> no, let's see. Maybe, maybe you are saying this. You can confirm. Okay? So, this is A times A, right? And A is emission, so you can bring 1 to the left. So this is equal to A psi, A psi. But if I have an operator A applied to psi, and I take the scalar product with itself, that's the square modulus of A so, and this is certainly a less a psi zero. So, cannot be negative. Hmm? Maybe this is what you are saying. So, the square hmm, and the all even powers of emission operator are um, have expectation value. So, if I ask you, for instance, what is the average kinetic energy hmm, of your uh, particle uh, uh, is the square of P, and therefore this is no negative. And remember that this is minus h bar square, the second derivative with respect to x, okay, that is hiding there, okay? So what I'm calculating is this, uh, and this positive just because of this minus, again, one of those strange things. 
the things that superficially look wrong, they are right, just because they are superficially wrong. Okay? So the minus makes kinetic energy positive, like as the I makes P emission. Okay? Good. So this object written in one of the two modes is non-negative. Okay? And is in fact the variance uh, of the measurement of x. The bigger it is, the more spread is the wave function in real space. Okay? The more and more the wave function is somehow compact, the smaller it is this quantity delta x squared. Okay? And in fact, in the limit of a sharply localized thing, the average and the square coincide and the spread is zero. Hmm? All right. Good. Now you can do the same thing for p. Okay? Again, remember I can measure p and I can measure the spread of p to be the average of, but I write it in the second way, p minus the average of p squared. Again, this is not negative because this is an emission operator squared. Okay. Mm. Now, I want to show to you, so the goal is to show that delta x times delta p should be greater or equal to h bar over 2, whatever psi I have. Okay? Cannot be smaller than this. This is Heisenberg uncertainty principle in its original formulation in full, in full glory. Hmm? I'm not using Gaussian wave packet, uh, special choices, which, by the way, we already calculated it was equal sign for the Gaussian thing, okay? No, full general thing, okay. Let's see, <clears throat> let's see how to prove this thing. It's a simple thing which has to do with the quadratic equation and parabola. Uh. Let's consider the following quantity, d of alpha hmm, equal to, let's do it in 1d, okay, so that it's simple to write things. The modulus the integral of x minus, let me allow to make the notation shorter to indicate this simply as average of x. Let's avoid repeating psi there. And this, the average of p. Otherwise, it's too boring and long. Okay? Average of x uh, times psi of x plus i. Notice the i. Alpha p minus average of p times psi of x modulus square. Okay? So I'm taking the integral of the modulus square of something which is essentially the wave function, whatever it is, with x minus the, the average applied to it, plus the combination of two terms. Okay? Don't ask now why I chose this very strange thing. Okay? Let's write it. Then you will understand later on what is the logic behind it. For the time being, I, I write it. Mm. I write it and I, I ask you to notice that if I define this object here to be an operator, okay, uh, it's a non-emission operator, right? Because I have emission part, another emission part, and I have plus i, whatever. So it's certainly not an emission, but it's an operator, okay? And I can write this as the integral of the modulus square of O alpha applied to psi. Is it clear? Hmm? Now, obviously, this thing is the integral of some square of something, so there's no negative. Hmm? <coughs> okay. How do you write 
this object. You can write it as O alpha psi O alpha psi. Do you agree, right? Is the definition of scalar product. Now, the definition of remission. I can write this as O alpha dagger O alpha psi psi. Okay? Very good. Okay. Um, now, O alpha dagger O alpha is a mission for any O alpha. Right? Let's take the emission conjugate. Ah, I didn't prove <coughs> the theorem about uh, adjoints. If I have two operators, A and B, whatever they are, the adjoints of the two is equal to the product of the two adjoints in reverse order. Okay? Prove it. Okay? It's a little theorem. It is useful, very useful. Okay? So if you apply it to, to, to this, you realize that I have to calculate O alpha dagger, O alpha, okay? Because, ah, the other property, the adjoint of the adjoint, whatever A is equal to the operator. So the adjoint somehow applied twice, restitutes back what you have, okay? So if you take the uh, emission conjugate of this, you have this, which is equal to O alpha, uh, dagger O alpha. Okay? Since this is a joint, it means that you can put wherever you want. For instance, I can put it here. Doesn't matter. Okay? Fantastic. Let's calculate now this. <coughs> Five minutes we are done. Okay? <coughs> Let me calculate for you O alpha dagger O alpha. Let's do it. Okay, remember, O alpha is this. Okay. So O alpha uh, dagger is x minus the average of x minus i alpha star p minus the average of p. Do you agree? That's the dagger of that operator. Because this is a mission, this is a mission, but this as the minus i alpha star. Good. Then I have to multiply by the operator that is x minus the average of x plus i alpha p minus the uh, average of p. Okay. One thing that I forgot. I write it like this and I take alpha real, otherwise there would be no need. If alpha is a generic complex, there is no real, real need to, to put an R, okay? So alpha is real here, okay? So alpha real, okay? So this is a real positive function, hmm? this D of alpha, of a, of a real quantity alpha, hmm? okay? Because of that, alpha star is alpha, okay? Let's calculate this, com this object here. This is equal to x minus x, x minus x. Okay, so x minus average of x squared. By the way, this object, okay? Plus p times p and minus i and plus i is a plus one. So plus alpha squared p minus average of p squared. Okay? Now comes the tricky product of p times x and x times p, the commutator. Commutator because they have opposite sign. Okay? So if you do it, you get, let's see, this you get plus i 
alpha <coughs> x p minus p x x p minus p x so the commutator and notice don't worry for these numbers okay because these are numbers and therefore they do not uh, contribute to the commutator okay fantastic now how much is this this is equal to i h bar so the result is minus uh, alpha h bar okay is it clear fantastic now let me calculate therefore d alpha hmm? as i told you d alpha first of all we proved that is equal to psi o alpha dagger o alpha psi okay we said it there hmm? but now we calculated this o alpha dagger o alpha and is equal to this plus this plus that okay the first term average is delta x squared then i have the second term that is plus alpha square delta p square and then i have minus sorry i need space minus h bar alpha okay so this real quantity d alpha real positive quantity of the variable alpha is in fact a parabola alpha square Let, let's try this alpha square with the coefficient delta p square uh, minus uh, h bar alpha plus delta x squared okay and you know that you should be no negative you remember that if i have a x squared plus b x plus c what is the condition for which this parabola is non-negative you remember I draw it. If it is also negative, there are two real roots. Okay? If it is positive, there are no real roots. If it is limiting, there are two coincident roots. Does this ring any the better? Has to be the discriminant, yes, yes. So b square minus 4ac b square minus 4ac should be non-negative negative. if it is non-negative if it is non-negative you have two real roots no if we should be negative, should be negative. Ah, yeah. or zero yeah, yeah, yeah. so you want you want these two possibilities yeah, yeah. not this okay okay let's try it. what is b uh, b is equal to minus h bar okay so this is h bar squared minus four what is a delta p squared what is c delta x squared okay you want this to be less or equal to zero okay which means if i allow me this okay divide by four this take the square root this okay so Eisenberg principle is the old discriminant of parabola if you do it right okay so you have to go through this little thing now in retrospect if you understand why here I choose these two things because these are the things whose square is the object that I want and I put them together hmm? with this uh, funny i alpha in such a way has to obtain then the commutator from the mixed term and, and and you see okay in retrospective you understand what guides the writing of this thing but certainly if i, I mean, you have never seen it and i ask prove it hmm, it would be okay fantastic okay so we have introduced a few extra tools and with those we did also a little bit of uh, mm, I would stop here for today okay
Next time we do the continuity equation, the concept of the current, and then we, we are almost done. We will do the time independent Schrodinger equation uh, and the first initial um, part is kind of uh, um, exhaust. Okay? So see you next. No, not next week. Next week we have a okay an interruption. So, so re read the read the lecture notes, do the exercise, okay? Ah, I do.